Welcome. We're delighted to have you on this beautiful afternoon. So um, I know you're in um, getting ready to have a treat. Um, Dr. Marcy uh, Cohen Ferris is a wonderful speaker, and if you missed uh, Bill last night, her husband. He was fabulous, and you can watch it online in, in case you missed it at our foundation webpage. But um, we also, they're wonderful authors, and we'll have their books for sale um, in the little lobby outside of this room. So feel free to stop by, and they'll sign them for you, okay? And we're very honored to have Mr. David Wheel, who has worked with Marcy many years in the past um, uh, in collaborations with Jewish history, Southern history in Goldsboro, and um, he's going to introduce her. And I don't think um, Mr. Wheel needs any introduction to you. <laughs> First, the formal. Born in Arkansas, only place I know, who, only person I know who came from Arkansas. <laughs> Graduate of Brown University, PhD at William and Mary and George Washington University, is now Professor Emeritus at UNC Chapel Hill, having taught in the Department of American Studies. Marcy is presently editor for Southern Cultures, a quarterly journal of history and the cultures of the U.S. South. President of the Board of Directors of Southern Foodway Alliance. Written two major books and co-authored another, Edible North Carolina, Edible South, Matzo Ball Gumbo. <laughs> Currently on the Board of Directors of Feast Down East, which is helping to build a healthy and accessible local food system in southeastern North Carolina. And now the personal. 
I've known Marcy primarily as a teacher extraordinaire. I had the pleasure of sitting in on four of her classes. Over my many years of schooling, I've had the benefit of a dozen or more exceptional teachers, plus two that were borderline incompetent. <laughs> so I know a good teacher when I hear it and when I see it. <laughs> Using the Socratic method of teaching by asking her students the types of questions that force them to think, she is the best at this that I have ever seen. And while other teachers relax when they're taking a break, like lunch, Marcy continues during the meal to ask questions that force her students to think and respond. But let me also add that she seems to attract a better class of students. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Marcy Cohen Ferris. Oh my gosh, wow, that's a hard intro to follow. Um, you know, I think we can, can we turn the lights down just a, a teeny bit in here? There we go. All right, so I wanna thank David. That was just so beautiful, and I'm, I'm so grateful to you for that beautiful introduction. But David and Emily Wheel, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about my relationship with them. Dr. Charlotte Brow, of course, who's chair of Wayne Community College's Humanities, Fine Arts, and Social Sciences Department, and Adrian Northington. There's Adrian, executive director of the foundation of Wayne Community College. Thank you all for hosting Bill and, and myself here at, at the college. It's really been an honor to be here and, and to also see lots of dear friends and to meet new friends like Nancy right out there. Just such a pleasure. And, um, you know, I, I just look forward to talking to more of y'all uh, while we're here. But I've worked closely with David and Emily as a teaching team um, in my UNC course that explores the history of the American Jewish South. And each year that I taught it, the wheels graciously brought our field trip to Goldsboro of students. We usually would have about 20 students and we would visit Temple Oheb Sholem, which I'm sure you all know is one of the most historic buildings in the state, built in 1886, the second oldest synagogue in North Carolina after the Wilmington Synagogue. And while we're there, you know, just a beautiful, beautiful interior and such a powerful space to be in. But while we were there the last time, we helped stu you know, our students helped to serve lunch at the community soup kitchen of Goldsboro, which is now there uh, happily, directed by the amazing Darisha Benton, who's just got everybody to do just what we were supposed to do. And really, I've been in a lot of synagogues my, my life, and a lot of small synagogues in communities like this that are struggling with changing populations, a decline in the size of the Jewish community, but I can't think of a more important use for a historic Jewish sacred place than to be a place to share food and love and care and all the things that our community needs, especially in these times. So we, we go from here and then after we go to have lunch, of course, that David and Emily host. We were downtown at Torero's, I think. And as David said, college students eat a lot of food. <laughs> and we had, we had a super good time. And, um, and then after lunch, we visited, of course, the stately Chestnut Street home of Gertrude Wheel. And throughout our visit, we learn a lot about Gertrude Wheel. Of course, we read the book by Leonard Rogoff about Miss Wheel, and then we end our tour at the Jewish section of the beautiful Willowdale Cemetery, which is really a moving experience for our students, largely non-Jewish students in my class, you know, maybe one or two Jewish kids in the class, you know, but to see what it feels like to see that Jewish community in memory in, in the cemetery. So thank you, Emily and David, for that. We're coming back next spring 
So, you know, we'll, we'll hope you'll be ready for us, you know, one more time. But what I want to do now is, is tell you a little bit about this work that I've been working on for, for quite a while, uh, Edible North Carolina, which was published, uh, la came out last year from the University of North Carolina Press. And my work began on it a long time ago, but in January of 2019, and who would have known when I started that year that I had about a year to get a lot of field work done across the state because we all know what happened in March of 2020, so that, that kind of was about it. But I began, then we all started to write at home, so thank goodness that happened. But I began a listening tour where I was really traveling. Bill said I should create a map, and I need to, of all the places that I went to around the state because I knew I had to meet with people and meet with kind of gatekeepers and, and folks who could introduce me to the different food worlds of our state, which are very complex. But my journey for Edible North Carolina really began in my classroom, in the, in the courses that I was teaching at Carolina. And in a course that I taught on American food cultures and food systems, we talked about all kinds of things. You know, not so much cuisine as we talked about how can we use food, how can we look at food to understand race and region and gender and class and working people, labor, religion, you know, my, the Southern Jewish experience here in Goldsboro, the fact that, that, that the synagogue is now an important food community kitchen, a soup kitchen, consumer culture, media, the politics, food and politics are so intertwined. In the divided nation that we're in today, we see a lot of that expressed in food even. But they all impact the ways that we eat. All those issues impact the way we eat in this country. So as you see, uh, food is political. One of my favorite bakers, uh, you know, put, he uses his, in Chapel Hill, he uses his, his bread, a chicken bridge bakery, as really a place to make statements and, and protests um, practically every week these days. And this is one of my favorite uh, chalkboards from on Franklin Street in Chapel Hill one day. I just love that, priorities, you know, eat, and then everything else, right? That's everything else. So as we studied the South as really a powerful foodways region, and there's Rob who does the bread, and he made some beautiful North Carolina ones with his son Simon, who now is baking with him. The South really took up a lot of attention in our class, because the South is such an important food voice in our whole country. It's got really one of the loudest voices, I would argue the loudest voice in our country. If we think about food as a language, as kind of a communicative language of place, which we know it is here. Y'all could start telling me. Why don't, yeah, I'll ask you. What what is food? What foods here would would you communicate to other people from away about this place? Barbecue. Barbecue, <laughs> barbecue for sure. And why why barbecue? Why does what's barbecue's history? What's behind barbecue here? Pork industry. Pork industry, right? And then we could go much further back to the fact that Eastern Carolina was the historic location of plantation experience in the South and of enslaved men and women who were pit masters and had that skill as well. So it's really layered, right? So other than barbecue, what else do we speak of here? Fried chicken. Fried chicken, for sure. Poultry and pigs. Sweet potatoes. sweet potatoes, very important crop here. More, more, more sweet potatoes is grown here than practically any other state, isn't that correct? I think so. Cucumbers. Cucumbers. Yeah. Thank you. Cucumbers. Pickles, pickles. Yeah. Pickles. Mount Olive. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's so important. And we get a Mount Olive variety pack every year <laughs> from these people. It's just like the best thing we've ever had, you know. But there are so many foods that we would turn to, you know, and, and we ate at Jay's last night, right? That tells us about another experience about a changing, a changing Goldsboro as well, right? So as we study place, 
we, I wanted my students to understand what we eat and why through a lens, not just focused on the South, but we decided just to focus on North Carolina. That just, and so we did one, one course that just focused on North Carolina and its food cultures. And I really knew that that was a way to talk about much larger issues in our country. Like what are the issues with our food systems and you know the standard American diet has a lot of issues today. And just that phrase, standard American diet, you know, the, the initials are sad, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's pretty sad. You know, and so often, you know, the South gets so, you know, it's such, it's so bullied for, you know, it's, for its problemed, you know, problematic eating, its problematic food systems. Oh, they eat terribly in the South. Well, I tend to, open that up a little bit, at least with my students, and say, what, what are we pointing to? You know, fried, cheap, uh, you know, um, snack food, convenience food. Uh, that's American food. That's what people are really, you know, and that's what working poor people are struggling, you know, to even get enough of that food. So it's less a Southern problem than it is an American issue, and it's a complicated, a complicated one. And so out of that teaching came the vision for Edible North Carolina, this book, and that was to create a portrait of North Carolina's contemporary food landscape, vibrant in, any, in many places, troubled in, in others. You know, abundance, malnourishment. You know, so everything that we can point to, we can kind of find the other side of it. But we do have one of the most vibrant food scenes, depending on where you are in the state. Um, but at least you're like we even know Goldsboro is really contributing to you know a regional, to a state, and to a regional and a national food economy in really important ways. So how do how do you do this? You know how do you go about you know trying to represent all this? Well, I knew it was really an anthology and that we had to get voices of important folks from around the state, you know, who, who live, this, live these food systems and food worlds. So I chose 20 leading journalists, chefs, entrepreneurs, scholars, activists, and food-focused specialists for our writing team. And I know y'all will recognize some folks, or you'll, you'll have heard of them. And here, I'll just point out, we've got Melinda Maynard Lowry, who I'll talk about a little bit more. She's a scholar that was at Chapel Hill. She's from Robeson County, uh, at Lumbee, and is now at Emory. Jamie Swafford, who is a farmer over in Shelby. Shorelette Ammons, who used to be a librarian here in Goldsboro, and then went on to become a uh, food ex uh, extension agent at NC State. Bill Smith, a formerly chef of Crook's Corner in Chapel Hill. Ricky Moore, who is at Saltbox Seafood Joint in Durham. He just won Best Chef Southeast from the James Beard Foundation. Chidi Kumar, who had a fabulous restaurant called Garland in downtown Raleigh. It closed after COVID, and her essay was about living through COVID as a restaurateur, as an entrepreneur. But her, her work led to the founding of the Independent Restaurant Coalition. She and about 18 others, including lots of folks in North Carolina, Ashley Christensen and many others, who got together and said, we've got to form a national organization to represent chefs and entrepreneurs because you know, they were getting very little support about how to maintain, how, how to keep going in these very difficult and trying times. Sandra Guterres, who lives in Cary and is a great author of Latinx and, and Mexican food cultures. Ronnie Lumby, Appalachian food cultures, and she lives in Burnsville, North Carolina, over in the mountains. And Courtney Lewis, who wrote an amazing essay about the Cherokee, the Eastern Band of Cherokee over in Cherokee. And she teaches at Duke. She's an anthropologist who did her doctorate at, at Carolina. So we also had uh, a talented editorial team, photographer Baxter Miller, whose family roots are in Hatteras, 
and her partner and the creative producer for the book, Ryan Stancil. And then this is Casey Highsmith. And Ryan grew up in Harnett County, so Harnett County. So I really felt like we had people that knew the state. Casey is a Texan, but has been going to school here, lives in Chapel Hill with her family. She's a food scholar, a photographer herself, and just finished her doctorate in American Studies. And she became the associate editor for, for this volume. And then y'all know Vivian, I know for sure, uh, chef writer, entrepreneur, and North Carolinian from Kinston, of course. Vivian agreed, Howard agreed to write the foreword, which really examines her first iconic taste of the state. She talks about how her parents would always like grab them up, you know, out of bed at like three o'clock in the morning and they'd go over to the Daniel Boone Inn, you know, in the fall or go to the Tweetsy Railroad and, you know, or Ocracoke, you know, in the winter, he, they, her dad like took him <laughs> over on the ferry to Ocracoke. But she describes all the taste of those places and of the kind of the iconic taste of this, of this incredible world that she was growing up in. And then left, y'all know, I'm not gonna tell you Vivian's story, you know it. But of course, Shep and Farmer is on a little hiatus right now as they make a decision about how to pivot with that restaurant. Still have Benny's Pizzeria in Wilmington and Lenore, the restaurant named Lenore that's in Charleston, South Carolina. Then after Vivian, uh, and you know, in Vivian, I wanted Vivian so badly to write the introduction too because she, her show, um, A Chef's Life, was really featured ingredients. She told the story of a place through ingredients, one ingredient at a time. I loved that. And I thought, oh, she really understands this language. And I remember, you know, there was one episode on collards and you thought, okay, she's really going deep. She did collard kraut, you know. I mean, it, it was just beautiful. I mean, she did dishes that nobody would talk about, you know, chicken and pastry and, you know, and that were really regional, you know, beloved dishes and gave them a, a national and an international audience. She's, you know, she's also a really fine journalist and writer and, you know, in her, her own right. Then, you know, I, I got on the road, like I said, because you can't really learn about a state from your little office chair. So um, we interviewed over about 100 people, uh, and you'll find their voices in Edible North Carolina in little box quotes that we have in, in each essay. And, and one of my favorites is this one. It's from Morty Gaskell who's a young fisherman out on Ocracoke, and he said, you know, when we were, had this long interview with him and with Harley Plyler, anybody go to Ocracoke in the summer and know the Ocracoke Fisherman's Cooperative there that Hardy and Patty Plyler are always there. Patty does the front uh, of the shop. She sells at the fish market there, and Hardy's in charge of the cooperative, which is a place for fisher folk to bring in their fish and, and then it's processed there and it's packed in ice and it's shipped off to wherever it's gonna go. Um, but Marty said, you know, Morty said, you can't have a quaint fishing village if you don't have fishermen, right? And he has had a commercial fishing license since age nine and is probably in his, you know, mid, 20s, late 20s now, and he got a history degree in North Carolina State. And But Morty and other North Carolina fishermen and women are facing a lot of challenges right now, and they're not that different from a lot of challenges that mid-level mid and small farmers are, are facing. You know, it's an influx of cheap, unregulated imported fish is what we see a lot. I know y'all probably are aware of kind of the shrimp issue, check where your shrimp comes from. We want to make sure it comes from, from North Carolina. A uh, lot of rising operating costs, right, with the cost of fuel and oil. Uh, that, you know, worldwide issues that are impacting our fishermen and our farmers right here in the state. A lot of labor shortages. Uh, aging fisher folk who, you know, are aging out like a generation of farmers as well and a younger generation pretty hesitant to come in with the huge you know, amount of monetary you know, investment that's needed 
you know, to take, take on a business or even to take it over from, from a family member. A lot of development pressures on the shore as well, too. I mean, you know, folks from out of state or in state, but, you know, buying up property, we're dealing with climate change and sea rise and higher, higher taxes because of that development. So, you know, I um, think about the food family because Bill, my husband here, who spoke last night, who's a folklorist, he always used this phrase to talk about the blues family that he documented as a folklorist in Mississippi in the early 1960s and the 1970s, the blues musicians and the blues family that were so connected in the, in the Mississippi Delta. And I started to think that I recognized too that we had a food family in North Carolina. And what's that look like? It's, it's lots of folks that you would be familiar with. Brewers, you know, the, 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 like to go to breweries around here. I'm sure y'all have, I've noticed, I saw that y'all have some good breweries here. Distillers, chefs like Vivian and others, uh, dairy men and women, farmers of all sorts, pit masters, of course, here, bakers. We went to Mickey's this morning. I was so excited. I have a t-shirt from Mickey's I meant to, to show you. You know, and I, the Southern Foodways Alliance, which is a really important organization over at the University of Mississippi, is doing a major project, uh, oral history on Southern bakers. And so they came and interviewed Melanie. It's Melanie Davidson, right? Is it Davidson or David? Daniels. Daniels. Daniels, thank you. And what they are three, she's the third generation of certified bakers, master bakers in that family. So we have a lot of goodies in our, in our car. But you know, that's just such a, a powerful tradition. Um, the fisher folk, extension agents, aggregators of local meat and organic products. <coughs> a lot of women in Durham, Sandy Chronic, uh, runs a group called Happy Dirt, which aggregates organic produce uh, and other, other food products up and down the East Coast, from North Carolina up and down the East Coast. Um, First Hand Foods is run by Jennifer Curtis. That aggregates um, small pasture-raised kind of operation pork and beef to restaurants from farmers to help them get, get it more easily. So, you know, agricultural administrators, faculty like at NC State, food systems managers in all our counties, they talk to me about how their worlds have both expanded but also diminished in, in the last few years. And then I wanted just to show you some of the folks that I spoke to in, in this region. I think one of the first people that I met with was Inez Rubastello. Y'all know Inez at On the Square over in Tarboro. She's just a masterful, amazing woman. She was a sommelier, you know, who knew so much, still knows so much about wine in the restaurant uh, on the top of the World Trade Center. And I forget what, it was like the top of the world or something, I forget the name of that, and had come home for a weekend, she and her husband, um, to visit her family in Tarboro when 9-11 happened. Yeah, no, no. And they opened, it's a little similar in a way to, to Vivian and Ben's story in <laughs> Kinston, with their family's help, they opened On the Square, which is a really sweet restaurant, and now have opened Tarboro Brewing Company, and, which is a fabulous brewery there. Um, also met with uh, Matt Hart. At, in, I was spent a bunch of time in Kinston. I've been there many times. I went to the farmer's market and Reynolds Seafood, of course, and so many other places. But Mother Earth Brewing is incredible. That's a really important business. Visited with Neil Moy of Simply Natural Creamery, which is delicious. <laughs> Over in Aiden, got to pet that little, that little guy or girl. And then, uh, of course, stopped by the Collard Shack in Aiden. And also nearby, of course, both within the same family, Sam Jones Barbecue, his the kind of upscale mm. version, and then, of course, the iconic owned by his father and grandfather, Skylight Inn Barbecue. I've, I've visited with Mrs. Gail 
Roberts Phelps and her sister, Miss <laughs> Kay Roberts of GK Cafe and Catering in Greenville. If y'all have not been, it's really good, the GK Cafe. And they also do the food for one of the country clubs in Greenville as well. But that was my, my boxed plate that I enjoyed that day. And then y'all may know the Hackney in, in Washington. Um, and this is Chef Jamie Davis, who's just doing incredible work in that hotel and restaurant. And then from there, of course, lots of time in the Core Sound region, Parker's Island, out to Ocracoke, the Outer Banks. And But I love Monica Smith is kind of standing in for a lot of people that I interviewed. Anybody ever bought shrimp from Miss <laughs> Gina's? <laughs> you just drive up there and buy from Monica. She's got incredible shrimp that her husband, you know, has a has a boat called Miss Monica, which I love, and, and, and they go out and bring in incredible, incredible shrimp. Um, and thank goodness we did get to visit Mickey's this, this morning. So, you know, Edible, North Carolina, oh, we also, they also had those wonderful peanuts from the Methodist Church that there's just no better. Although we, we're we huge fans of Birdie, uh, Birdie County peanuts and Birdie's peanuts, and we, we buy up those at Christmas time. Um, so I wanted to just quickly tell you about um, what we discuss in the book, and then I'll just open it up. We can talk about a, a little bit more of the scene here as well. But Edible North Carolina brings the state's food family to the page in essays that explore issues like the local seafood movement that I was just talking about. Those two essays are written by Karen Amsbacher, who is the director of the Core Sound Museum down in Harkers. And you know, she grew up, she was born in Marshallburg, so she really, really knows the issues and the challenges that Fisher folk are facing. She, I swear she sometimes spends more time in Raleigh lobbying with our legislators about the challenges of independent and commercial fishermen in our state. Um, and another essay by Ricky Moore, which I talked about as well. Ricky's essay is excellent because it is kind of a 101 guide for how to participate in the local seafood movement in our state. And y'all live close enough to the coast to, I don't have to tell you, you want to buy local, you want to buy fresh, you want to buy in season, you want to buy from folks you know. And if you're buying at the grocery store, you just want to ask, where is it from? You know, and can you get North Carolina? And, you know, we also enjoy seafood that Lynn Peterson and Ryan Speckman, who both went to Appalachian State, studied, you know, wildlife environment kind of, you know, curriculum, and they own local seafood in Raleigh, which is another one of those aggregating groups, and these are usually start, started by young people who got their academic training in North Carolina, like at NC State or App State, and locals goes to the coast, all up and down the coast, buys fish like from Hardy and folks at Ocracoke or many other places, and then brings it back into the state. And it shows up at your restaurants or at your grocery stores. You know, because for so long, like at Harker's, Karen was telling me on Harker's Island, you couldn't, kids didn't have local seafood in their cafeteria. You know, it just wasn't available. It, it was going to like, Fulton Fish Market in New, you know, in New York City. You know, it was hard to actually get what Karen said to our students, fish, North Carolina fish is your inheritance. It belongs to you, you know, and so I think about I think about that a lot. Um, and also the local seafood movement, it sometimes gets kind of ignored in the local food movement. We think it's only about agriculture and about, you know, the, the interior part of it, but it's our coast, it's fishing, it's trout, it's, it's a huge industry and movement that we need to support. We also have two essays that look at the meaning, the identity, and the sovereignty issues that are surrounding indigenous food 
that belongs to and is grown by Native American people in our state from the eastern band of the Cherokee Indians over in the western part of the state to the Lumbee here, you know, in, nearby where we are. So Melinda Maynard Lowry and Courtney Lewis both wrote essays on the, those topics. And Melinda argues, what is Southern food? You know, what's the simplest definition for Southern food? It's indigenous food. You know, that's where we have to begin. You know, we go all the way back to the first peoples of our region, and, and those are foods that we still enjoy today, you know, just iconic foods that Native people began eating and cultivating and catching and growing here. And what food sovereignty means, that's an important phrase that Courtney Lewis talks about. Food sovereignty is like a right that we all have to choose the healthy, local, food of our choice, affordable, that we care about, that we make that decision. And so Native American tribes and folks, Lumbee, Cherokee, they want to make those same decisions and have important foods like ramps and local mushrooms and many other things that they forage for. They should have the right to those foods, and that's considered food sovereignty. <laughs> And a few other, a few other topics. Uh, Black-owned farming, African-American farmers, the strong family food bonds of Eastern North Carolina is a really important issue in our book. And Charlotte Ammons, who was that Goldsboro librarian, she wrote the essay on that about her family in Mount Olive, North Carolina. And, uh, it also looks at the joy, the, the family, the deep family connections, what she grew up eating, how she learned about the food cultures and traditions of her family. But it also looks at issues of black land loss, of so many black farmers who've lost land because of racist treatment or the racism or because of the inability to get grants from the US Department of Agriculture. There have been major law cases, uh, Pigford, uh, the Pigford 1 and 2 case, which was a, a, a huge case, a class action case where African American farmers across the South came together and won their case finally, not enough, but, but won a case to argue that they had systemically been denied loans um, by, by, you know, by, uh, those systems throughout in, in practically every every state. Um, also, barbecue, of course, had to have an essay about barbecue, and this one is by Andrea Weigel, who's a veteran journalist in our state. She wrote for the News and Observer for years and years, and then she's really become um, a major producer. Uh, she worked with Vivian Howard as a producer and then has now got her own independent business as a writer and consultant and journalist. And she looked at issues of both pasture-raised pork and what we'd probably be more familiar with here, industrial-raised pork. But there's a number of young, largely younger farmers in the state in eastern North Carolina who are part of the pasture-raised pork you know, growers in the state as well. Um, and so she interviewed Ryan Butler from Green Button Farm in Bahama, Elliot Moss, who's formerly of Buxton Hall Barbecue out in Asheville, and then, of course, Sam Jones as well. And I wanted to put a, a picture there of Wilbur's, of course. And I don't know if Mr. Ward is still a pit master at, at Wilbur's. I know Wilbur's has gone through a lot of, 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 of challenge. But I love this photo by Johnny Autry of, of Eddie Lee Ward. And you know, Wilbur's, it's got such a deep history, started by Wilbur Shirley, 1962, always used hardwood, and you know, and then worked with amazingly talented people like, like Mr. Ward. There's another essay by Carla Norwood and Gabe Cumming who run a nonprofit group up in Warrington that's called Working Landscapes. And 
they look at the challenges of absent food systems, of dislocated food systems in low income rural North Carolina. So even smaller places like Warrington, you know, than Goldsboro that suddenly no grocery store downtown. You know, suddenly no, no, no processing place for small farmers to take their pigs to or a, or, you know, or a cow to. You know, the lack of food infrastructure <coughs> that once was so strong within communities, smaller communities, is now really disappearing. And what do we see when those grocery stores disappear? What's another important site on our landscape? Dollar General, right? <laughs> right. We see them. We see them everywhere, right? And they've really served an important food need for for lots, lots of folks. And I, I often go in too, you know, just to check to see what you know, kind of fresh food is available too. But you know, there's kind of more and more because there, there can often be be it. But the idea of working landscape of their organization, they're they're both. PhDs in environmental studies from, from, North, from UNC. And Carla come, grew up in a Lumbee family, but Carla and Gabe, with working landscapes, it's how to re-restore those sustainable food economies in our community so that we serve the people that live here and they're no longer that kind of you know, absence, complete absence. And then we, we talk, of course, climate change. That comes into so many of the essays. You know, how it's impacting really fragile plant and animal ecosystems. I mean, we only have to look to everything that's just happening in the States this last week. Tornadoes, flooding, you know, extreme weather events, rising, warming seas, the loss and the outmigration of different species, uh, toxic, uh, waste that's showing up in our coastal estuaries and marshes. You know, often you know, the, you know the, the problem with historic floods and the problem with with pig lagoons as well. And you know, we've we've always had here on the North Carolina coast. There's an incredible diversity of fish species because of the Labrador current and the Gulf Stream. You know, meat like right off of the Carolina coast, and it just creates incredible abundance, probably more than any other place on, on the East Coast, but it's a warming coast, right? So when you talk to folks like, you know, Monica at Miss Gina's Shrimp, you know, she's like, the shrimp's coming in at a different time, or it's coming in earlier, it's coming in later. You know, all this is, is happening with this changing, changing climate. And of course, Where's that? Anybody know? Highway, Highway 12. 12. How many times have, have we seen that happening? Uh, we, there's a wonderful <laughs> essay by Kathleen Purvis, who's a, also an old-time journalist, uh, worked for the Charlotte Observer um, in, in Charlotte. And she looked at kind of the working class foundations mm -hmm of food systems and restaurants in North Carolina cities like Charlotte. So if you turn back and you looked at Charlotte's mill history and you know many other industries, it's banking industry, it's high tech industry. But back in the day, kind of those in that industrial history of Charlotte meant that people needed a lot of places to stop, cafes, drive-ins, walk up places to grab good food hot, affordable, filling, you know, and, and get you through, you know, so you can make it through a hard day and get yourself home. So it, it's like Brooks Sandwich House, which is downtown uh, Charlotte, and, you know, it's really famous for its chili dogs. Anybody ever been to Brooks? It's kind of a hole in the wall, but it's, it's really fantastic. And then, of course, uh, Bill Smith wrote about the influence of contemporary uh, new Southern L Latino cuisine and cooks. Uh, both Bill Smith and Sandra Gutierrez wrote essays about this and about the impact of contemporary immigrant culinary skill and labor and entrepreneurship in North Carolina food uh -huh. cultures. 
And, you know, it's not an accident that these folks, you know, who don't have their citizenship but are important parts of Bill's community here, you know, are facing that way, <laughs> you know, when we took their photographs. You know, so there's been in complicated politics about the road to citizenship and the immigration politics for the Latinx workers and chefs who are the backbone of, me, of most of our restaurants, you know, today. And again, that contemporary immigrant culinary voices, it's from everywhere. Mexico, all over Latin America, China, Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, the folks, uh, Jays, Korea, uh, India, Bosnia, Ethiopia, the Middle East, and more. And these photos are taken on Central Avenue in Charlotte. And if you ever want a great eating day, Tom Hatchett is a terrific historian who wrote an essay about Central Avenue and that kind of world global food scene that's on Central Avenue. And you can take a food tour with Tom Hanchett. He's a great historian of the New South. And just go up and down Char uh, Central Avenue and eat at all these amazing mom and pop owned sandwich shops and grocery stores and you know just a million little restaurants that are all really, really good. And represent you know, a very changing Charlotte. You know, those were malls that began to see better days, right? You know, it was like your radio shop, you know, shops were there and, you know, all small businesses. And they began to decline. And these food businesses have really found an affordable place for rent and, you know, in a, in a changing Charlotte. And then the next generation of North Carolina's food family is young. You know, it's folks like... Charlie Ibarra at Jose and Sons in Raleigh, the Ochola family who had a Palace International was a great little Nigerian restaurant in Durham that's coming back. Oscar Diaz, of, that's Oscar, that's Charlie over there of Jose and Sons. And their stories are just incredible. These folks own an amazing, I can't remember their names right this second, but they own an amazing tea shop and restaurant in, in Durham. You know, and that next generation of North Carolina food leaders also includes many more young black farmers and farmers <laughs> of color today. Like, this is Howard Allen of Faithful Farms, uh, which is in, he started that in 2013. It's in Orange County. And he always has huge lines at the Carborough Farmers Market. He, like a lot of other Young farmers today are starting to grow their produce and vegetables under high tunnels. And I'm sure that's been done forever. <laughs> Wherever Mount Olive gets its, its cucumbers from and other, other vegetables. But it really helps to make this survivable in, you know, to make, you know, your, your farming work in a world of changing climate. It also involves no-till farming as well. And I, I was telling Leslie or, em or Emily, that we have a, a, a CSA that we get every week. That's a box of vegetables that comes from a, a farming family, Vera and Gordon, that we buy that comes to us once a week. It's called Community Supported Agriculture or CSA. Does anybody get a box like that delivered? So it's maybe a little bit more common in you know our area, but you write a check to your you know, beloved farmer at the beginning or once a year, they have that income, and then you get your box that you pick up once a week. And we pretty much get it all, almost all year round. There's only a, about a month when, when they stop, like in August when it's ridiculously hot and kind of recoup and they're getting seedlings planted and ready for, for the winter. Um, and, you know, that's... It's a, it's a great way to get food, and, but we really recognize that we're privileged to be able to pay that kind of money and afford it and, and partake of the food in, in, that, in that particular way. 
And you know, I also, all this work led to understanding there's a lot of women's voices that are at the heart of food leadership in our state. You know, and I just constantly was reminded of that as I was going across the state, that those really seem to be the strong, strong leadership that I was seeing. So, you know, I'll just close out with, you know, I think how do I define North Carolina's kind of contemporary food movement? I, I think it's what I said here, it's an intersection of culinary excellence, of creative entrepreneurship, of changing populations, of historic yet evolving food ways in our state. It's about the struggle for racial justice and equity and food sovereignty, but it's also a commitment to protect and sustain food resources, you know, I think for generations to come. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there and maybe we can have time for some comments and questions a little bit more. That's my my <laughs> If you have a question, raise your hand. We have, um, we'd like to get it for those watching online. We were talking too before, does anybody go to the Goldsboro Farmer's Market or to the curb market? Yeah, and that curb market's a really historic curb market. Nancy, you were talking about the curb market, which was what, started in the 30s maybe, 1930s? Um, the other one I know of is in Greensboro, a very famous and, and well-known farmer's market. And Nancy was remembering, and I've seen pictures of it. You know, it came out of out of home demonstration movements. You know, that were run in those same era by Jane McKimmon at, in Home Ec at North Carolina State. She was director of of home demonstration and assistant director of. Of, of extension for the state of North Carolina, but the curb market women, who were probably you know farmer women themselves, um, wore white crisp uniforms, you know, because it was also emphasizing the pro that it was professional and it was hygienic, you know, in that era, you know, that you could trust. They were pushing against industrial food systems that they were really competing with. You know, so to take your eggs and butter and your casseroles and your fine pies and your yeast rolls to curb markets really was an important income. Any questions? I have a comment. When in Goldsboro, I think we're pretty lucky because we've got some local farmers that you don't have to go very far. I mean, a lot of them do bring our yeah. curb markets over here in the Maxwell Center now, but. It is, um, it's, I mean, you can go eat north, east, south, and west and find a, a local farmer that sells produce, especially oh. during the summer, so yeah. that's nice. Yeah. And are, are y'all seeing uh, small, young, uh, younger farmers beginning to kind of come to try to farm independently? Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yes, and they were going to the wine. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Right. Right. Do you know, or does anyone in this room know, if the NC State uh, Food Co-op that they uh, set up in the s summer, and you could kind of um, join that and on a weekly basis receive food, is that still functioning? Oh, oh. Was it called? Walking fish or something like that. I know. I don't want something happened to it. Yeah, because there there are several co-ops like that, you know, that are available. Yeah, there was one called Walking Fish. There's locals in in Raleigh, but it's just like a community supported ag box. You pick up your fresh fish each week. I just didn't know whether it still exists. Yeah, we, we participated. The walls, and, and, uh, yes. and uh, we'd love to do it again. I just didn't know what happened. Yeah. And it could have been an experiment they did for three years and they were done. I don't know. Yeah. It was NC State. Yeah. It was at Cherry Hospital, right? Yeah
Yeah, but if you write me, if you write me an email, I can check with the local folks too. Anybody else? Yeah, I wanted to mention too one other group at NC State that I didn't mention: the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. It's called. Everybody calls it CEFs. That is a, one of the most important programs in our country for sustainable agriculture. I mean, you know, you can go to state to learn about all size agriculture, big ag, industrial ag, um, and small and mid-sized farming as well. But the CEFs program is really important, and it's a lot of young women have come out of that program and are starting these aggregating programs, and young men as well, of course, who started these aggregating programs for livestock, for vegetables, for fish, and a lot of other kind of innovative businesses that have really are helping to create a sustainable food economy across our state. I've got a question, Charlotte. Could you speak a little bit more about the program in Southeast? Oh, yeah. North Carolina, the yeah. Feast Down East. Did you, do you know Feast Down East? Uh, I know a little bit about it, but yeah. I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about it. It's great. You know, we've loved Wilmington and went for years and years, but I always have known about Feast Down East because it was one of the most successful nonprofits that didn't disappear, <laughs> that mm -hmm. is an important food hub. So they have a little food hub, which is in the old railroad station in Burgau, mm -hmm. and they go around to small farmers. And again, it's just to save time and money because the whole thing, the, the real challenge is to get the, the produce from small farmers and especially farmers of color or underserved farmers who don't have that much time or the, the gas money, you know, to get it to local schools, hospitals, restaurants. So it all comes to the food hub and then the food hub folks at Beast Down East have a truck, a refrigerated truck that we dealt with that for years as board members, like the refrigerated truck, <laughs> you know, because I mean, it's crucial, right? And that then delivers, you just do your order, you get your, the restaurateurs, the, the, the institutional folks get the, you know, go online and just check an order and they can get good quantity what they need. So there's the food hub piece of it. Then during COVID, when so many restaurants shut down, they took that food, boxed it up, and made it available to families in need in Wilmington, and that was great. And then people loved it so much, they've kept that going. And then they also have very small farmer's markets in, in needy neighborhoods that don't have a grocery store. So they'll just pull up with a van, put out a table, put out what's in season, you know, and families can walk. Because that's, that's that whole idea of like, Food, what's it called? We used to call them food deserts, but it's called food apartheid because it really means, you know, you didn't choose to live in a place that didn't have food access. So it, it, it helps to bring just some fresh, fresh seasonal food. You know, this time of year it could be collards and, you know, you know eggs and, you know, whatever else is showing up in the market. But it's, it's a really, really, really good group, and I... I've been, and they work really closely too with UNCW as well. Anybody else? Uh, Dr. Ferris, you used a term in your, was it something about a tunnel, a hollow tunnel? Oh yeah, the high hoops. That's where I have to Yeah. Do y'all have those, are those all over Mount Olive high tunnels? Well, y'all don't grow there, because yeah. So you grow from all over, you get from all over the world. Um, High, so they're just like hot houses. Like, you know, the, you'll see them on small farms or big farms. White, I saw some when we were coming in today, white plastic over a hoop, over like a, you know, a, sem a semicircle like that. And you can just control the watering and the temperature. You know, not, not the temperature too much, but it, it avoids a da you know, a damaging windstorm like we just had, or you know, frost or snow or ice, mm -hmm. and it really. So we we have a winter season now of our of our CSA, which is great because you know the vegetables are just like kind of extra sweet during the winter time. But those hoop systems are really important, and also again, you're growing 
not like in raised boxes, but kind of raised, you know, um, beds. Uh -huh. They can weed a lot more easily there. Mm -hmm. And and because it's most, a lot of folks are growing organically and they're not using pesticides, um, uh -huh. then they can, it's no-till as well, which means if you, you couldn't afford tractors and all that kind of startup costs. So it's a good way, it's, it's pretty essential now for small farmers that might even only have an acre or two that they own or share. I mean, I think that's what Gordon and, they farm with another couple and another guy, you know, together, bought land together. Because that's another issue, it's so hard. Who can afford land? Who could, who, who could, who could deal with all the startup costs and then all the risks of farming right now. So it's just one of those factors that's really, really helpful. I have time for one more question. Anyone else? I think she's gotten us ready for lunch. Don't you know <laughs> some of those I'll, pictures? I'll tell y'all, you know, oh my goodness. just the last thing, you know, just, you know, you, are, you live here, you already support your local food economies. That's the biggest thing that we can do to really help also fight climate change and you know make a difference in our communities is to vote for people that pay attention to the food system right pay attention to your food and water um you know it's kind of crazy that you know people that are elected officials don't talk about it but it's we saw what happened during covid and we saw the kind of shortages that people were experiencing so think about that when you're voting ask people questions about what they think about local uh, local seasonal affordable food for all people, and and then just support your local economy, your local food folks as much as you can. I'm sure many of you buy from the from the front, you know little food stands and all. We want to give uh, Marcy a big round of applause. <laughs> I hope. Um, We've had a wonderful spring. Those of you who've signed up for the Whirly Gig, um, you know, tour that we're going to take next week, we'll do that. And then coming this fall, we hope to have some um, interesting lectures for you. Um, hopefully we can find people as good as Marcy and Bill Ferris. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.